That's the domain of artists. Our role is really to push back from rules. Our role is to really have people slow the read down for people to have to rethink what they think is normal, you know, the society deems as normal. Critical inquiry is really the key and growth of the imagination. In some ways, that's the destruction of our democracy. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week the biggest story down to earth. Let's go back to 1993. The Jamaican-born, Harlem-based artist Neri Ward was barely out of his 20s that year when he exploded onto the New York art scene with Amazing Grace, an extraordinary installation of 300 baby strollers that he found abandoned around Harlem. The work, installed in a dimly lit former firehouse, resonated with audiences as a humble yet startling commentary on the seemingly endless crises plaguing New York City. The AIDS and crack epidemics, rampant homelessness, racial violence, and a city on edge after the Crown Heights and City Hall riots. In the nearly 30 years since, Ward has maintained his role as one of our mourners-in-chief, and his latest exhibition at Lehman Maupin Gallery in Chelsea is no exception. That show, titled I'll Take You There, A Proclamation, again taps into musical and cultural history to offer a sobering reflection on the COVID pandemic and its devastating fallout of economic inequality, political instability, and profound loss. More than anything, the brilliant new exhibition, which continues Ward's use of refuse and discarded objects picked up around the streets of the city, suggests that none of us, not even Ward, knows exactly where we're headed next. To get a sense of the ideas behind this show, Artnet News Managing Editor Pak Pobrick sat down with Neri Ward to talk about this remarkable new work. So, Neri, I want to thank you, first of all, for joining us on the Art Angle podcast. And I want to congratulate you on the exhibition. It's a pleasure to be here. It's titled, I'll Take You There, A Proclamation, and it's open now at Lehman Maupin in New York through June 4th. I had the pleasure of seeing the show yesterday. And the first work that you see when you walk into the gallery, it's Harlem Driving School. It's this installation. It's made up of traffic cones, and there are these burnt slabs of wood. And you also have dozens of these spent prayer candles that you collected from makeshift memorials around Harlem, around New York. And I'm really interested in the process here because I know that you went out and you replaced all of the candles, the spent ones, with fresh ones so that you always left something and didn't just take, but you also gave. And you mentioned when we spoke a few weeks ago that this almost made you into a sort of a caretaker which is, I think, something that most people don't associate with the responsibilities of an artist, right? To sort of take care of somebody else's work or somebody else's memory. What did it mean to you to become a caretaker? What did that demand of you? Thanks, Frank. Thanks for going to see the show. You know, basically, it was a, by accident that that happened. I really was just trying to think about what would be the proper moral way to get this material that I really needed to activate my own imagination and and my process in the work that I wanted to do. And then when I started to bring the new candles to these memorials, I realized that I had to kind of organize them and put the memorial back together again. A lot of times they, it was disheveled or things were broken. So I ended up kind of cleaning the area and, and putting the new candles back. So in that sense, it was something kind of unexpected, that other component and really wanting to, like you said, take care of that space. I think also in general, it made me kind of reflect on how little the notion of care is ascribed to the sidewalk, right? The sidewalk space is kind of like everybody's space and nobody's space and property owner space. So there's this whole idea of the caring being dialogued with a sidewalk space was something I got really intrigued with on a kind of conceptual level and a kind of practical level. So in some ways, the project kind of led me in that direction that also was a surprise to me. Can you tell me, is there anything in particular that you feel like you might have absorbed from that? Was there a lesson that maybe seemed to become very clear just doing this over the course of... Well, yeah, yeah, because I think in the past, I looked at that space as more a space of chance and unpredictability. And I think that the idea of being a sort of categorized as a so-called fond object artist was uh, sort of ascribed to the practice that I've had. And I think for me, this whole other element of care and gathering, communing with this nondescript moment of time and landscape, which is a sidewalk, was really, in some ways, another kind of empowerment, because it it meant that it wasn't really about 
the place that made the experience special or it was really about the gathering, the calling of like-minded individuals to a particular moment. Considering that really opened up the expectation for the installation, but for what a kind of memorial could be. Now, I know that some of the candles came directly from a memorial that was in front of a police station, and this was a memorial for Wilbert Mora and Jason Rivera, the two New York City police officers who were killed in Harlem mm-hmm. in January. And I know that when you went to replace those candles, I think you mentioned you saw an officer there. Can you describe that experience? Yeah, it was kind of an anxious moment because basically the memorials for these two fallen police officers was literally maybe 10 feet or 12 feet away from the front of the police precinct. And all the police precincts, I think this might even have happened before the pandemic, they kind of have police at the front door. You no longer could just walk in. I think across the city, that's the case. So they were literally right there viewing this transaction that was going on. I was thinking in my head, I better get my story straight because as an artist going into this other kind of judicial space, you want to make sure that you figure out how to frame your language. (laughs) So I was thinking about what I would have to say to them. So in fact, they saw what was going on. They saw that I was putting new ones and taking the old ones. And they didn't really say anything apart from one individual came in. And I don't even know if he was actually a police officer. I think he might have been just a delivery person or undercover. He could have been also well. And he said, you know, thanks for doing that. Don't forget my brother on the other side. So, you know, that was kind of interesting that he said that. But For me, it was just odd to be in that position where I was anticipating some kind of exchange and it was kind of like understood that I was there to take care of business in terms of the caretaking of the memorial. Yeah, it's interesting. There are obviously all kinds of different memorials that people can build. There are memorials for COVID victims. There are memorials for people who've been hit by cars on bicycles. You often see these painted white bicycles for people who've been killed around the city. You have this memorial that we're talking about here at the police precinct. Is there some sort of common denominator to these memorials that you found as you walked around and were paying close attention? The thing that I got really intrigued with is, and I think maybe that's what led me to wanting to do this investigation, was really the the common denominator is death, (laughs) really. It's really this unknown space that we're all going to have some engagement with, right? And I think that level of mystery, that level of anxiety, I think is shared. And that becomes almost like the glue for whatever denomination, whatever it practices. It becomes that through line that in some ways joins folks. And it's powerful because it can never really be owned or named. We say death, but we don't really know what that is. And there's different ceremonies for navigating the experience of it collectively or individually, but it's still this abyss. That's the power of it. And for me, that search and that journey, you know, in some ways it is all connected to art. It's our desire for mortality. You mentioned the difficulty of naming, and I think your work is often about that, about the difficulty of describing what it is we're seeing and what's brought in and what we're experiencing. And there's one work in the show It's one of the shoelace works. It's titled exactly after a Claude McKay poem from 1919, If We Must Die. I wonder if you could tell me why that poem spoke to you and what bringing that poem into the exhibition allowed you to do, because it is a very clear sort of naming of the work and also of the poem, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So that poem was written in 1919, like you said, by Claude McKay, a Jamaican-American poet and writer. I was really intrigued because a lot of the works that I was framing with the shoelaces, re-engaging with text, was coming from a historical vista. Like I really wanted to focus on whether it's the civil rights era or some kind of protest dialogue that we now look on with some sense of maybe nostalgia. And it was really about like, how do I take that and bring it to a kind of contemporary space and really seeing that it's just as relevant now as it was when it was written. And so in that poem, though, I think it's important to also think about the history of that time. This is before Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism movement and Black Power movement. So white supremacy was sort of unleashed. There was no social media to call it out, right? You know, so it wasn't until like the 60s when things could be properly documented, the media at the time, that, you know, we got King speaking about the idea of nonviolence, that the witnessing of this trauma and tragedy. 
would bring a kind of moral uprising, right? But prior to that, Black folks were just hung. Lynching was like a pastime, American pastime. I'm just saying this to sort of bring you the context of what this poem is written in. And postcards were being sent of lynching as if it was a celebration. So this American history was really whitewashed, for lack of a better word, and not really dealt with. But I felt like that poem not just brought it back, but brought back this idea of the resistance against that. It's like fighting back no matter what, even if in the face of death and in the face of this white suppression, just making sure that we hold our dignity and be strong, no matter if it means we must die. And I thought that was prophetic, just coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think was part of seeing that through the lens of the pandemic was really interesting to have to navigate that and think about that now. And for me, it was just about trying to look at those two moments and thinking about where do we go from here. Well, and it's such a powerful poem, I think in part because it's so short. It's very succinct. I'll just read the first four lines. It's, if we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot. It's a very, very... Mm sharp phrasing that he's decided on. And it struck me that, of course, you must have been thinking very closely about exactly what it was he was saying in this very short work. That's exactly, exactly it. And I think I was also led to it because of its seeing death, not as the end, but death as this challenge to fight, to challenge to sort of leave a mark. And so often we think about the finality of death. And I think within his poem, just the gesture of how he talks about death is really about a baton to keep fighting and to keep struggling and to keep living. It was a baton to the living to keep the strength and fortitude. For me, the work I think that struck me the most was the short video that's in the show, which is also called Harlem Driving School. And it was very unexpected to me this clip. It's this video. It's shot from, I think it's the windshield of a car. And it's a very snowy day in New York. And all you can hear is this kind of soft rumble of traffic. And then you have the voice of Juan. I think that's how he introduces himself. (laughs) Yeah, Juan. And he's giving a driving lesson, right? And he's advising the student. And he's saying, basically, look ahead, look around, be alert. That's what you owe to yourself, your family, and your community. But the whole time that he's telling this, the camera is just getting completely covered in snow. So there are parts of the video where you can't see anything. You can't look out. You can't see ahead. The path forward is not clear. This work was a revelation to me because it really struck me as such an apt summary of where we are right now. We're trying to look forward, but it's very unclear what exactly we're supposed to do to begin resolving any of the many problems we have. I love your description of that, Pat, because that's what I wanted was that Juan is this, he's very sincere, very sincere guide and instructor. And I kind of felt like he's the one, because he's leading us through this space of devotion and loss, right? Because all uh, the Harlem Driving School installation are these totems that have the candles, the spent candles. So you're sort of walking through these candles, around these candles. And that's kind of what I wanted him to be like, this guide through this space of the unknown, through this space. I want to say death, but maybe more the mysterious future, right? And so... He's very sincere about what he wants you to do and what he thinks is necessary for you to survive and take care of your community. But then there is all this uncertainty, like you're saying, uncertainty of where do we go and how do we navigate this vision that keeps getting obliterated by the precipitation that's coming on the camera, of course, of the snow. There's this balance of being supported and guided and being taught. And then this other space of the landscape that you're navigating into is totally uncontrollable. For me, Juan is like the community getting together. It's the gathering. It's us trying to find a way to control this space of death. And I kind of feel like I wanted to pit them into some conversation, into some choreographed dialogue. And so the driving school became the apt kind of a metaphor for that. Now, what would you say that you see in terms of the relationship between these two works, both called Harlem Driving School, There's the installation, then there's the video. How do you consider them together? So I really wanted, when you walk into the space, you just hear Juan's voice, right? Like you just hear him giving the instructions to go left, do this, do that, going through the streets. And at some point when you enter the installation and come out, you'll see the video and you'll get the full visual of where that space is, the landscapes. But that installation specifically was always about trying to capture 
two spaces, right? Trying to capture that space of the street, that space of the uncontrollable, the flux, the kind of intense urban environment. And then the space of the gallery, which is one more about control. And it's actually the entire, I guess, aim of the YQ historically has been about bringing the viewer to that moment and extricating all the other moments. So almost like this kind of weeding out of everything else so you can be in one moment, like a church, right? You know, in a sense, being in this kind of introspective devotional environment. And so I felt like that installation was meant to be a kind of link or bridge to these two kinds of expectations for one, the street, and for one, the gallery. I really wanted to sort of set the viewer up for the next room, which is where you have the Still Lives of Stepladder installation. Let's talk about that a little bit. So that work is, in part, directly a call out to Morandi and his still lifes. How did you think about Morandi when you were making this work? You know, Morandi is one of these artists that you could easily just kind of write him off as a still life painter. And I think he falls into that genre. But there's something about his still lives that I've always, and I think a lot of people have written about, this kind of haunting search that a research that he seems to be engaged with. There's a kind of monochromatic, and this is not his entire body of work. There's a particular series of years that he started doing much more similar kinds of bottles, like arrangements, and then peering down the colors, peering down the forms, peering down the scale even, but then repeating the same thing over and over. And, and I always felt like this was him trying to bring us to maybe a, a psychological space, but definitely a space of mystery. So I think it's that combination of the psychological and the mysterious that's inherent in his still lives and his compositions that I kind of reflected on when I would go out in the morning times and walk around the city, but before everybody got up during the pandemic, I would just see all these bottles on the sidewalk, you know? And I think that is why I felt like there's some mystery, there's something haunting, there's something, an emotional, a psychological space that needs to be engaged with and told about. And I think that was what led me to wanting to make that link and using Miranda as a kind of filter for the installation itself. Well, in the work, it's very striking. There are more than 800 liquor bottles that are included in the work, empty bottles. And they really stand out. I mean, it's impossible to miss them. They're very clearly meant to say something in particular about a time and place, where you collected them, the people that live in a particular place, the problems they're going through. They're quite evocative. I also wanted them to disappear, <laughs> right? That's the thing. I wanted them to be intensely present, but also to disappear in the sense that I wanted them to take on another space of expectation so that they're enshrouded by this landscape barrier cloth, this black material. And then I would sort of scorch them, fire again, bringing fire back into it. I'd sort of scorch them after they've been covered. And the scorching kind of did two things. It revealed the actual glass again in its parts. And then it also sort of sealed the barrier cloth around the material in a really kind of tight, form-fitting manner, almost like I was, you know, coating them in some ways, you know? It's sort of like putting this black material as almost like, as paint that was really important. That barrier cloth is a, a cloth that within the landscape industry, it's, it's used to separate the good soil and the bad soil. And I thought at the same time, it's control, but it's also about kind of nurturing. And I thought there was something interesting metaphorically and poetically about using that for the material. Now, the bottles, of course, they reminded me, and they might remind others, of there's that work by David Hammonds. I think it's called Night Train. It's the series of bottles that are sort of wrapped around into a kind of circular form. It's this uh, mm. sculpture that he made after collecting, I believe that they're wine bottles in particular. Now, I think a lot of people consider you in relation to David Hammonds, but Oakley and Wazer makes this really nice point in the catalog for We the People, which is at the New Museum. And he says, well, sure, they have quite a bit in common, but one thing that they do quite differently is that David Hammonds often uses materials sort of as synecdoches, right? He uses smaller amounts, and they're meant to speak to larger holes, whereas you kind of collect mass amounts of things and allow them to speak in a kind of different way. Does that sound like a fair summary? I'm honored to be put in the same conversation with David. He's a friend, and uh, I have nothing but huge respect for his practice and him as an artist. I'm not trying to be humble. I'm just trying to always think about the context. So David came up in a different time, different era, post, I guess maybe you'd say the insurrection of the LA riots. For me, it was more during the sort of 90s Harlem, the sort of dysfunctional nature of Harlem in the 90s, a lot of urban space across America. But I think I was thinking a lot more 
you know, about how to create the space for the viewer, not just the objects being experienced, but like, how do I push back from the white cube and create with these materials, create another envelope of a landscape or innerscape for the viewer to go into? Do you think about a work like Amazing Grace, the baby shower piece, you enter that piece, or even the shoelace works spelling out a particular text, it's relating to the body, right? So it's always really thinking about how to place the body the viewer's body into this other envelope of a materiality to have this other kind of experience for the material itself or for the object they're viewing. Now, in terms of naming, to go back to that a little bit, because we touched on it, I'm also really interested in the title of the show and what that does for the work and how it frames it. So it's titled, I'll Take You There, A Proclamation. How does that help you do something specific? I think it was trying to do two things at the same time. So, you know, I was really thinking about this idea of a journey. And that's why Juan, the driving instructor, was really such a pivotal character protagonist in the installation. Because he's, he's sort of leading you and guiding you and telling you that you'll be safe talking about community. And again, it's this kind of sincere mentor that I wanted to bring into the conversation. And then there is this idea of the sidewalk space, this kind of public decree, this claiming a public space. And I felt like I wanted both those kinds of considerations. I wanted the notion that I was going to bring the viewer in their own psychological journey to another kind of experience. But I also wanted this notion of making it to be about a public gathering. It's funny you ask that, Pat, because I was torn for weeks between just labeling it one or the other. And, I, and I, at some point I just said, you know what, I'm just going to combine the two, which is actually, they're also the namesake of the shoelace pieces as well. So I, I figured two is better than one. And that's how we end up getting that title. <laughs> no, that's great. I, I, I like that quite a bit. But can you tell us too a little bit about those two separately and where they come from, where those phrases come from and why they spoke to you? Yes. Yeah, so I think proclamation was really me bringing back what I wanted from the shoelace works, right? Like important work for me is the We the People text, taking this kind of, I guess, overlooked or often seen but not considered language and then finding a way to slow it down. And then at the same time, by slowing it down, visually voluming it up and then conceptually layering it by just its presence, its contemporary presence. And I felt like I wanted that contemporary presence in the show. The question for me was, well, what do I want to say? You know, I think there's a lot that's being said. I just wanted to think about the voluming up of it, the public decree. And so that proclamation text came in. And it was important for me to use a text that was calligraphic, right? Because I felt like I wanted to tie it to the We the People, the preamble to the Constitution. It was a calligraphic text. So that's why it takes on that form. For me, talking about positioning the viewer for maybe official, <laughs> claiming official, but official for the folks, right? Because it's made out of shoelaces, so it's just for the regular folks. So there was something really intriguing about merging those two things. And then the I'll Take You There is really coming from the Staple Singers song. And actually, the text is coming from the album as well. The song was written, I guess, a little bit after the civil rights era. I remember the song. I remember hearing the song and young enough or old enough to have heard it back when it's being played on the radio. I always thought it was just a fun, feel-good song, promise song, you know? And I think that when you start to listen to that song, it really was a song that actually crossed over to the pop field, but it was a protest song about taking the listener to another place, a better place. And I thought that was really exciting to not think about death necessarily as the end, but maybe this journey is about going somewhere else in a positive manner. Oh, that certainly makes sense with the context of the show. And now that you mentioned traveling, I'm brought back again to Juan. One of the things that he says that I think is so fascinating is he says, when you follow the rules, everything is beautiful. Now, the yeah. reason that he strikes beautiful me... beautiful quite a lot. <laughs> he does, he does. And he's very sincere, as you say, very sincere. Yeah, yeah. And he truly cares about the people on the street that he's trying to drive around. It really matters to him that everyone's safe. Yeah. Now, this phrase in particular struck me because the rules 
for driving are clear. That's fine. There are specific rules. But the sort of moral, ethical, political rules that we're navigating now are really quite different than they used to be. And in fact, a lot of the rules as they existed were quite perverted. So if lynching was a national pastime and that was an okay thing to do as a rule, obviously Mm. something was very wrong there. So how do we deal with this situation? We have a situation where if we follow the rules, everything is beautiful, but we can't see clearly ahead of us as we're driving through with Juan. The snow is covering the camera. How do we make sense of that situation? That's what really spoke to me, I believe, when I saw that work. Yeah, I think that's the question, too, for me. And I think that's the domain of artists. Our role is really to push back from rules. Our role is to really have people slow the read down for people to have to rethink what they think is normal, you know, the society deems as normal. Critical inquiry is really the key and growth of the imagination. In some ways, that's the destruction of our democracy. You know, we can't find ways to engage. You're sort of hitting on a topic now that's really true to me. In a sense, I feel like the digital era promised so much, but in fact, it's a dangerous form because it can also become a kind of lazy armchair. Right. And I think the artist needs to kind of shake people up. The manner I choose to do that is with materiality. Right. Like I feel like the digital and that light space is all about conjuring something else, conjuring an imagination to go to some prescribed place, some algorithmic place. And I kind of feel like the messiness of materials, the messiness of the crowd and our intimacy is what is most redeeming. And I feel like that's what needs to be fought for. And so that idea of gathering, that idea of protest, that idea of finding a kind of coalition, which is what the peace walks are all about. And it's sort of reflecting on what happened in the night during the pandemics and people just kind of, even the, the most dire of moments, they just kind of came together to be together. And I feel like that salvation of being together is redemptive. I feel like that's the hopeful component. Is there a component that's less hopeful? I think if we don't acknowledge our mutual humanity, then I feel like that's the most dangerous thing. And I think it's easier to deny that humanity in the digital space. Talking about what we've gained from being in post-pandemic is a kind of appreciation of this manner of dialoguing, the Zoom and the digital meeting. And I think it's a tool that's great, but it shouldn't be used to replace intimate conversation of the union. That's what I feel like we need to really fight for. And without that, it it becomes a dangerous territory to go into. I agree with you. I think it's actually quite an unfortunate tool, this this whole (laughs) setup. But I suppose it's sometimes uh, what we have. I have a question for you. You mentioned imagination, because we talked a little bit about memorials already. And now there's a related topic which is monuments, what they're supposed to do, what purpose they're meant to serve. And I ask you because you mentioned to me that this very radical idea had occurred to you for monuments, that maybe instead of being permanent, that they should be mobile so that presumably they could acquire new meanings in different places. How do we get there? Because I imagine that would require a very different type of imagination than the one that most artists and certainly the public, certainly politicians, most people, I would say, have right now? Yeah, I don't know if it can ever happen because I think the nature of us as humans is to want to consecrate a particular space. It happens in the church. It becomes like the Godhead, the place that folks are to gather around. In some ways, it's an aspirational notion that we can have these symbols of power that are part of our regular rhythm. That would be great if we could have that. Right now, our portable monument is our money. (laughs) That's what people put down as the portable monument, transactional. And it's based on a particular history, that history of capitalism and and manipulation and labor, complicated issues around that. I think the way to bring it back to nature and have it become about nature, like a lot of indigenous cultures, and they're not glorifying that, as saying like everything else is bad and this is good because it's pre-industrial. But I think there's something about that in terms of this notion of democratizing that regard of the monument. I think there are artists are interestingly trying to think about it and like finding ways to assess light 
or finding ways to assess the canyon or the landscape in the, the desert. I think there are artists who are thinking about that in a very different way. For me, it was really about how can the expectation of the monument being in one place be subjugated for it to be not like this idol, but more something that moves around the planet. I'm interested in monuments that are not specific to a particular culture. And I just wonder if that's possible. I'm just throwing that out there, that it's open for a bigger dialogue with the environment, with Earth itself. Well, and it seems to me that this conversation about portable ambulatory monuments has to be very directly related to the kinds of materials you often use. Baby strollers, for example, or even a work like Crusader, which is built into a shopping cart, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. These works can literally be wheeled around galleries or even outside <laughs> if you wanted to. Yeah, Pat, you know, if if you look at the body of works I've done, I was kind of laughing. It just kind of happened. And in one moment, I was thinking about it. You know, I've worked with the baby stroller. I've worked with the hearse. <laughs> so I've worked with the ambulance. You know, so I've worked with the shopping cart, you know, it's a consumer culture. So, yeah, I think I was always thinking about not about place, but about movement. It was never about trying to fix something in a particular place. It was always about referencing the notion of or the gesture of anticipatory journey. That journey could happen here. It could happen in China. It could happen in you know Europe. I feel like that desire to take on those forms was really about disconnecting it, disengaging it from the immediate space. The notion that in the imagination of the viewer, this could be anywhere. And in fact, it has been anywhere because it's been in front of my house. I've used it in a supermarket. Their connectedness to it is also really important. It occurs to me that even though things are, are mobile, they can be moved around, that Harlem still, as a place, as a very particular place with a specific history, I know it's very important to you. You said once that if you hadn't moved to Harlem in the 1990s, that you wouldn't be the artist you are now. And I think for anyone who knows your work, it's clear why that's true. I wonder, could you name three places for us, I'm curious, in Harlem that are particularly important to you, that you're drawn to, maybe that you return to, or simply that have been important to you, and why? My first studio was on 125th Street, 125th Street and Lexington Avenue, in fact, an old ballroom. And I think that street, even now, it's complicated. I mean, one side of the street from the east side to the west is totally different. But for me, the dynamic nature of that street, and it's kind of a cross-section of New York City because you have, is it Metro North or, yeah, I think it's Metro North. That station is right there. It is Metro North. In fact, I know for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then you have the Lexington Avenue line, then you have the East River right there. So there's all of these components, and then the West, you know, you go West and you have the Apollo Theater and this historic old sense of Harlem. And I feel like that journey, you can go from one side of 125th Street to the next, says a lot, even about the city and maybe even about the country. So that's one thing. Another really favorite boulevard of mine is Lenox Avenue. Or Lenox Avenue is one of the broader avenues in Harlem. I just love being on that street. It's that width, you know, there's a middle section. I thought Broadway had that, but it doesn't. I think Lenox might be even wider. Because the sidewalk is that much wider than Lenox Avenue. So there's something about from Lenox Avenue up from 155th Lenox Avenue all the way down to like 110th Street is really special. Another sort of secret gem of Harlem that I always like, I discovered, and I feel like it's a poetic moment of the past, is on the very top of what is now Marcus Garvey Park, there is this fire watch tower, which is kind of a throwback to another era that's still there. And I really love going there because back in the day, it was how, you know, there was no alarms, so there's no telephone. So somebody would stand there and watch to see if a fire would appear, and then they would try to get some help there. So there's something really, this technology from another era that's about looking, it's really intriguing for me. And so I sometimes go there just to check in on it. That's three. But there's another one that I kind of enjoy going to is on 116th Street, there's an African market. I used to actually be on 125th Street. Giuliani moved them to 116th Street. And I love walking through there and just kind of finding something. I don't buy a lot when I go there. I, I look a lot. I look, I'm a, they probably know me now, just somebody who looks a lot at stuff. And, and occasionally something catches my eye and I might purchase it. But I enjoy the energy of that 
sort of commercial African diaspora space. I feel like I can picture that quite easily, you looking very <laughs> closely through this very particular kind of place. That's what you do. You you go and you look. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It can be annoying to somebody who's ready to do the bargain, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just I'm just here. Thank you. <laughs> wow, they'll get but over it. Uh... They'll get over it. <laughs> Let me exactly. ask you one one last question, and it's something that, that is only occurring to me just now. It might take us a little bit away from what we've been talking about. It has to do with being a parent and being a person in the world and being an artist. I ask because I have children, too. I know you have children. Right. Can you say anything about how having children affects the way you think about your work or has changed the way that you think about your work? Because you've been working for a long time and your children are a bit older now. So is there anything you can tell me about that? It's something I've been asking people that I know have children. Yeah. As you know, Frank, I teach in the uh, City University at Hunter College. And that's something that comes up a lot in my younger students. A lot of them haven't started their families yet, but that's an anxiety around surviving as an artist, right? And my role is to sort of just let them know what my experience is and add to vocabulary of possibilities, maybe. What happened for me when I had my first child and I was nervous about how that would take up time, how am I going to navigate time, you know, my practice, I think it made me better at organizing my time because I knew that, and in fact, I didn't really want to be the studio as much. I enjoyed going and watching this young person grow. So I kind of had to be more surgical (laughs) about the amount of time I was going to spend in the studio. Like before my child, I could easily 12 hours of meandering, just kind of like, try this, try this, do this, you know, kind of almost like nesting in the studio was, was really important. And that was an important part of getting in the right mental space to make the work. And I think when I realized, okay, now I'm going to only have three hours and I have to come to some conclusions, it kind of made me have to be more efficient. And and in some ways, it made me a better artist because a lot of the meandering was, was really mixed with procrastination. That's one thing. And the other thing is, as they get older, being willing to let go, not having to control everything. You know, and I think that's also been beneficial in the studio. Like now that I've gotten a little more success and I'm also working with artists who are helping me make stuff and I have to tell them what I want them to do, I have to come back and sometimes say, oh, that's not what I wanted, but that looks good (laughs) to it. Keep going. So just being open, just open to what other folks are going through and what they can add to the mix. I think kids allowed me to, to be more receptive to not just my own way of doing things, but how somebody else might see something. Well, that's wonderful. I appreciate that enormously. I'm glad I asked you. Neri, thank you so much. This is wonderful. We really appreciate your time. The show is open now at Lehman Maupin through June 4th. It's titled, I'll Take You There, A Proclamation. And everyone should go see it. It's a wonderful show. Congratulations on it. Thanks, Buck. My pleasure. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manoli, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.